Hello class, my name is Emily Duncan and I'm your instructor for this disaster epidemiology course. If you haven't yet, please watch the introduction video posted under week one. It'll provide a little bit more information about me, communication methods, additional information of what to expect over the semester, and information about uh, this course just in general. But with that, we'll go ahead and jump into our week one agenda. Um, we're going to talk about public health emergencies and emergency preparedness, disaster epidemiology, the strategic national stockpile, and medical points of dispensing. So these today will just be big, broad overviews. We'll go into additional detail on all of these topics in uh, later lectures. So jumping right in, public health emergency preparedness is the ability to prevent, prepare for, protect against, respond to, and recover from health emergencies. Um, so disaster epidemiologists will be involved at every step here in the cycle. So public health emergencies are emergencies whose scale, timing, or unpredictability threaten to overwhelm routine capabilities and or resources. So these are not your everyday emergencies. It's not a car accident or medical emergency. These are emergencies where resources are depleted or we expect that they become depleted during the course of the disaster. This could be things like needing additional ventilators during COVID um, or needing additional staffing like contact tracers or nurses uh, to staff a skilled nursing facility during an outbreak. So what is disaster epidemiology? It's simply epidemiology applied in disaster settings. It's the provision of reliable and actionable health and needs information to incident commanders, planners, and decision makers. So the data and the information we're providing is being used to uh, inform the response. The goal is to prevent further morbidity and mortality. So again, the information and data that we're providing can help with adjusting priorities, allocation of resources, or projecting or planning for the future. So that key distinguishing factor is actionable information. So the information that we're providing will be used hopefully in real time to, to um, inform the response. It's not just putting out studies to help build up the literature base, it's going to be used during the response. And this can be before the disaster, we can help with investigations um, or evaluations. During the disaster, we can help with surveillance to figure out which communities are most impacted, uh, to figure out if our responders um, are staying safe, and if not, what are those big safety concerns and trends? And we can help with needs, needs assessments, um, and then after disaster, tracking and registries. In 1999, the National Pharmaceutical Stockpile was established to ensure the nation's readiness against potential agents of bioterrorism like botulism, anthrax, and smallpox. After the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, the federal government decided to strengthen public health readiness and officially establish the Strategic National Stockpile in 2003, expanding the medical countermeasures to be able to respond to public health emergencies outside of just bioterrorism. Um, so the Strategic National Stockpile is a repository of medical countermeasures that can supplement state and local health departments during any type of large public health emergency where state or local resources become depleted or are expected to become depleted. Resources can be delivered to any state within the United States within 12 hours of activation. So examples of times that the SNS have been activated um, include in 2005 during Hurricane Katrina and Rita, more than 3,500 beds and critical medications were sent out. More than 130,000 tetanus and diphtheria vaccines and 145,000 hepatitis A and B vaccines were, de were delivered to Louisiana. During 2009, um, influenza vaccines were sent to help with the H1N1 pandemic. In 2020, more than 27,535 tons of cargo were shipped to support the United States efforts and state um, PPE needs with more than 748 flights, 5,745 trucks transporting supplies. And that was just as of August of 2022. In 2021, um, an unaccompanied children crisis, critical PPE and medical supplies at intake sites were sent to help unaccompanied children at US borders. And again, in 2022, vaccines and antiviral drug treatments were sent out to states to help with the monkeypox outbreaks. So you can see that the SNS is activated for a range of uh, different emergencies um, and life-saving supplies can be sent to any state. 
So diving into the, the strategic national stockpile a little deeper, what are medical countermeasures? Well, they're life-saving medicines and medical supplies that can be used to diagnose, prevent, protect from, or treat conditions associated with chemical, biological, uh, radiological, nuclear, or explosive events. These can be antibiotics, vaccines, antiviral, chemical antidotes, things that we talked about on the previous slide that can be sent out to state and local governments during a public health or de during a public health emergency. Um, an area within the SNS is ChemPAC. So these are containers of nerve agent antidotes to allow rapid response to a chemical incident. And these are housed um, at hospitals or at first responder agencies. They are confidential locations, uh, but they are almost 2000 containers that are strategically placed in 1340 locations across the United States. What that means is that more than 90% of the United States population is, a, is within one hour of a ChemPAC location. This is important because unlike most of the incidents where uh, the strategic national stockpile is deployed, the 12 hour deployment window is too long for a nerve agent incident. So we have pre-positioned these containers so that from the event of a ner nerve agent incident, these containers are there and they're readily available. So once the SNS is activated, the federal government sends resources to the state or local health department, but it is up to the local health department to dispense these prophylaxis to their community. So during a bioterrorist event um, or a pandemic, they do that through points of dispensing or medical points of dispensing called MPOTs. And these are locations organized by public health to dispense prophylaxis to large numbers of people to prevent, minimize, or treat disease in response to public health threats. So the idea behind these is that they are mass dispensing sites that were originated again in response to bioterrorism. So they originated such that the local health department needed to be able to dispense prophylaxis to the entire community within 48 hours. So the goal here is fast. So there are medical versus non-medical impods, depending on what is being dispensed. So medical impods are those with vaccines, those that require a nurse to be able to dispense. But during something such as an, an anthrax attacks, where it's dox, doxy or cipro that are being provided, uh, you actually don't need a nurse to do that. So that is a non-medical pod because you can use volunteers or your public health, other non-medical staff to dispense these. And there are different modalities here. You can have a walk-up clinic or a drive-through. So during uh, COVID, when we had these large mass vaccination clinics, that those were impots and some of those were drive through or some of those were walk up. So the concept behind impots is that participants go through the clinic in a sequence of defined steps to fill out paperwork, have their information screened, get their answers questions and receive medication. And we say eligible participants because people might show up that are sick or symptomatic, in which case they have to be turned away and sent to their primary care provider. Um, we have people that show up that might not be eligible to receive the medication or they're, they have contraindications, so for health reasons they can't receive it. Um, or eligible participants could mean that um, not everyone is at this point eligible. So like in the beginning of a pandemic, vaccines were very limited. So the only eligible people were those in the first tiers at one point. Um, so eligible could mean different things. And depending on the eligibility of your uh, impod, the, the way that you design it, and we'll go into that later, might differ. Expanding a bit on eligibility, we come to type of MPODs. And the first we'll talk about is a closed MPOD. So a closed MPOD is a location operated by a single entity or an organization. So that might be a skilled nursing facility or a shelter or a hospital or a jail. Um, but it's something where a, where a specific organization is going to dispense prophylaxis that they receive from the health department only to their clientele. Another uh, type of pod would be an open MPOD. This would be like what we saw on TV. These are the mass clinics uh, where the, that are designed for the public. Now, when I say open, it doesn't necessarily mean that anyone and everyone from the public can come at any time. Like we saw with COVID, um, when vaccines were limited, we still might see tiers. And so it might be that only certain um, sections of the public are eligible at that time. But this, these pods are where the public will go. Another type would be a first responder pod. So this is when the health department will go and, and run an MPOD at um, the police department or the fire department or with EMS. And all of these are beneficial and will be used in certain situations um, and different strategies. 
So a closed end pod is very beneficial to everyone because an organization knows that their workers are protected, but it also helps the health, local health department because that's fewer people that we have to serve at our open pods. And this becomes really critical in situations like if there were ever a bioterrorist attack where we needed to dispense prophylaxis to the entire community within 48 hours. So the more closed, partner, closed pod partners that we can recruit, the better it is for us and the public. And with first responders, that's also crucial because these are the people that are out interacting in the public and more likely to become exposed. So that will bring us to the end of part one, but please continue to lecture part two under week one. Uh, in part two, we will continue on and we will go into more detail about what an impod looks like and what those actual operations look like and the planning considerations. So thank you and I'll see you soon.